and um, uh, Kevin McManus uh, holds a B, uh, bachelor's uh, degree in economics with a math minor and a master's in business administration. After a 25-year career at Hewlett Packard in various software engineering and program management roles, he decided to get in touch with his inner, <clears throat> I'm going to have to, I'm going to slay this thing here, econometrician. And econometrician, as, come on. Oh, econometrician. Hey, I'm a double E. I, I never saw that word before. And rebrand as a data scientist. Kevin has had data science engagements in business intelligence, product recommenders, and neural network image object detection. He currently volunteers at Little Thompson Observatory as a telescope operator and data scientist for LTO's radio telescope team. He is studying astronomy at the University of Colorado in Boulder, Colorado. Uh, Kevin, uh, go for it. Thank you. Okay, thanks for the intro, Rich. Um, <clears throat> yeah, okay. Uh, hello, everybody. And uh, um, this, uh, what I'm about to show you is, is uh, grown out of a paper that I did for my astronomy class at CU Boulder uh, last spring. Um, kind of lucked into it in the sense that uh, I like to do, you know, certainly I'm a practicing data scientist. And uh, um, with his astronomy class, uh, we, you know, we had to research something and, uh, you know, look up a bunch of information and whatnot. And uh, in, in doing that, I stumbled across the uh, website for the European Space Agency Gaia satellite. And uh, there was just, I was just blown away with the wealth of information that was available there and how easy the, the uh, uh, information was to, to get a hold of. And so being a, being a data scientist kind of guy, uh, and with all this data there, I decided that uh, it's time to apply some machine learning techniques to the uh, information that's on the um, uh, Gaia data, uh, on a Gaia satellite website. So um, <clears throat> basically the problem that we're gonna try and solve here is uh, when, you look, when you look at any particular field of view, like if you point a telescope at a cluster, you're going to see a whole lot of stars in your field of view, and it's not clear uh, just from looking at the looking through the telescope which stars actually belong to the cluster. So we're going to try and use a machine learning technique to um, identify the cluster members and separate them from the background field stars. All right, so this is the way it's going to work. <clears throat> so first, we're going to take a look at the Gaia spacecraft. Uh, which is really our telescope for the um, for the exercise at hand, and we're going to look at the take a quick look at the data that the um, uh, spacecraft provides. Then we'll, um, based on some papers that that also come out of the Gaia consortium, based on some uh, uh, published papers, we're going to get membership lists for. Uh, cluster members for nine nearby clusters, and we'll um, we'll take a look at how those clusters, you know, how far they are away from the observer, and how far the individual members are from their um, cluster centers, and uh, we'll produce HR diagrams for for each one and take a look at that. Then we'll take a look at the Pleiades. We'll take a look at the uh, take a look towards the Pleiades. And we'll do what's called a cone search. Uh, this is essentially pointing the telescope at the Pleiades and seeing what we see. And um, we'll we'll take a walk through the data that we get back uh, from that from that search. <clears throat> from there, we'll actually take a look at the mixture models. I'll give you a quick overview of what a mixture model actually is, um, and then show you the feature matrix that went into that mixture model. Um, in uh, data science applications, we got these cool things called hyperparameters. And, and the problem with hyperparameters is you have to pick them. And, and so we'll go through uh, how, that, how that actually worked and then uh, take a look at what we got back as exactly which members were identified as being, which stars were actually identified as being members of the Pleiades cluster. And then, um, <clears throat> then we'll take a look at the, look at the model performance. Uh, how well does the model do? And uh, uh, avenues for future research. Okay, good so far. I'll take that as a yes. Okay, let's take a look at the Gaia spacecraft. Um, Gaia spacecraft was launched, um, I'm going to say 2012 or 2013, uh, so about seven or eight years ago, 
And its uh, main mission in life was to gather parallax measurements on, on objects. And it's been phenomenally successful at doing so. Um, the uh, graph uh, in the lower right side of the slide, you can see it's got 1.7 billion stars uh, for which it's, it's gathered the position and brightness information on. So the, the, the Gaia database is really, it's a, it's a database that has 1.7 billion records in it, one record for each um, uh, star that, uh, that Gaia has, has uh, observed. Um, this uh, orbital diagram here, uh, you can see that it's in an L2 Lagrangian point. Please don't ask me to explain it because I couldn't. Um, but the punchline of this is that the Gaia satellite doesn't actually orbit the Earth. It orbits with the, word, with the Earth radially uh, around the sun. And then that forms the baseline measurement that Gaia, Gaia uses in its parallax measurements. Um, and let's see what else is cool about it. Um, <clears throat> As far as instrumentation on it, there's three general classes of instruments on the, on the spacecraft. Uh, there's a set of instruments that do astrometrics and astrometrics is um, uh, concerned with measuring the position and, motion, position and motions of uh, the objects under observation. And that's uh, in contrast with the BPRP. Uh, these are photometric uh, um, Spectrometers, I think is the right word. Uh, anyway, they're photometric instruments. And basically what they do is, is um, measure um, uh, flux density uh, in the blue region and in the red region of visible light. And then the uh, last instrument, which actually we won't concern ourselves too much with in this exercise is the radial velocity spectrometer. Uh, again, going back to this picture in the lower right corner, um, <clears throat> Uh, the key, couple of key things to drive home is that for uh, stars, that we have red, uh, um, uh, red measurements on, we have about 1.4 billion. Uh, we have just a little bit fewer on uh, the blue color. And so this is important when we actually uh, look at the, uh, at the cluster members and um, uh, try and calculate their colors, uh, which, we, which we're going to need for identifying what's part of the Pleiades and what isn't. Um, the orange bubble here, uh, we have parallax and proper motions on uh, 1.3 billion stars. So that should, that's enough to keep us, uh, keep us busy, keep us occupied. This stuff is all wonderfully documented. Uh, and I encourage you to take a look at the Wikipedia page, uh, Wikipedia, you know, repository of all human knowledge now. Uh, take a look at the Wikipedia page uh, to get a good overview of the Gaia spacecraft. And then um, if you're interested in the uh, actual um, nuts and bolts of, of what Gaia has to offer, you can look at the European Space Agency's um, uh, archive uh, website. And uh, there's just, there's a huge wealth of information there. Okay. All right, so let's take a look at our telescope eyepiece. If we go to the uh, archive website, which is what I have circled up here, um, <clears throat> and then you hit the search tab, uh, that, brings up, uh, that brings up another page. And uh, there's, a, there's a tab on that page called Advanced ADQL. ADQL stands for Astronomical Data Query Language, which is a kissing cousin kissing cousin of structured query language, SQL. So if you're familiar with SQL, SQL is very popular um, in basic database circles, um, a lot of applications and a lot of different um, 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 subject domains. Uh, so if you're familiar with SQL, you're, you'll be a snap to learn ADQL. They're very similar languages. In fact, um, I don't think I can tell the difference, at least not for what I've done so far. So anyway, so, uh, <clears throat> so to use the, IP, the telescope eyepiece, you type your query here, uh, you hit submit, come back in a few minutes, and you have a pile of results that you can sort through. All right. Uh, also on the uh, Gaia website, there's a whole collection of papers. Um, if you go to the documentation section on the website, uh, it, it'll take you to a page that's got maybe 50 different papers uh, that describe different aspects of Gaia, uh, different science that they've done with the Gaia data, they being the European Space Agency and the Gaia collaborators, uh, of which there are legion. Um, 
<clears throat> but anyway, all the papers are all uh, nicely documented and nicely referenced here on this page. The one that I've circled is one that uh, I've based a lot of the information in this talk on, and that's, uh, that's a paper called Observational Hertzsprung-Russell Diagrams, where the authors, uh, the guy at collaboration again, the authors go through and uh, actually develop HR diagrams for a whole lot of different uh, collections of stars. Um, one thing that comes out of this uh, particular paper is that they have membership lists. <clears throat> they have membership lists for some nearby clusters, some not so nearby clusters, and then a whole bunch of uh, globular clusters. And so it's those membership lists uh, that we're going to look at right now. So <clears throat> um, if you open up that paper and you, you fetch up the, the, uh, the member list, uh, for the for the different clusters, and then grab the Gaia uh, grab the the Gaia records for it. You can produce a cool plot like this. So for the nine uh, nearby clusters, uh, what this plot shows is that the, the this this plot shows their distance uh, from the observer from us, um, and you can see the distances are anywhere from uh, 50 parsecs up to about 250 parsecs. Uh, that's the definition that the authors of the paper from which this member these membership lists are drawn. Um, that's the that's their cutoff for nearby clusters. Uh, the cluster that we're going to look at in detail here is the green one, Pleiades, and you can see it's just under 150 uh, parsecs away. So make note of that number. 100, it's a little bit less than 150. Write that down somewhere because we'll we'll need to take a look at that in a minute. Um, each dot on this diagram is an individual star. And this particular diagram, uh, it's called a swarm plot. Um, <clears throat> each, each dot on this diagram is an individual star and the dots are plotted in such a way that the software goes to some length to make sure that the dots don't overplot. But they do overplot a little bit. You can see here on the edges that they're uh, that are sort of plotted over each other. Anyway, uh, the key thing here is that the the Pleiades is is less than is approximately 150 parsecs away from us, the observer. Another thing you can do with a Gaia data and um, a Hive plot again is uh, you can calculate the distance from the, the distance that each star has from its respective cluster center. And as you can see from this plot, with the exception of Alpha Persei, that the, that the stars that make up a cluster, they're all on the order of about 10 parsecs away from their center. Um, there's some stragglers that go out, um, but for the most part, they're within 10 parsecs of their center. And so that's important when we go to identify um, the cluster members. Okay, any questions before I move on? Sounds like no. All right. Uh, right. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so in the previous graph, we had uh, we had individual members for each one of the um, each member of each cluster, and if we produce Hertzsprung-Russell diagrams, which are uh, color magnitude diagrams, um, you see what we have on the screen here. And so for the nine uh, over on the left side of the screen, we have a, a an HR diagram for each uh, each cluster individually, and then down at the bottom, which is uh, blown up in and uh, which is enlarged over here on the right, uh, that's the composite diagram. So a couple of key things to point out about this uh, diagram. If you look at the composite, uh, first of all, the main sequence, and I'm hoping you're all familiar with the HR diagram. Um, the main, the main sequence is fairly well defined. Uh, most of the stars um, along, lie along a, a pretty narrow band along the main sequence. Um, there's a few stars, not many, a few stars over here in white dwarf land. Um, and then there's a few stars here on uh, what is called the um, uh, blue horizontal branch. So these are stars that were red giants and are now headed back to the, or headed Back, not to land on the main sequence, but they're they're going through their final their final death throes. Um, but anyway, so that's the that's the that's the composite diagram. All right, <clears throat> so now let's take a look towards the Pleiades. Um, and as I said in the in the intro, we're going to do a cone search and uh, uh, see what we get in return. All right. 
<clears throat> um, so the first thing we need to do is is let's get the uh, let's get some known information about the Pleiades, and this is going to come from the online catalog called Simbad, the uh, astronomical database. And uh, <clears throat> in Simbad, you can search by identifier. Um, you can type in uh, the Pleiades in the uh, identifier field. Where else? Uh, you hit submit. Bada bing, bada boom. You get uh, information about the Pleiades, and so uh, useful information. So this is this is information about the cluster center, and um, uh, good inf good pieces of information that you get. You get its right ascension and declination. That's here. Uh, you get its proper motions, uh, 19.997 milliarc seconds per year in in right ascension, uh, minus 45.5 uh, in declination. Uh, you get its parallax measurement, that's very important. Um, and you also get its radial velocity, but we're not really looking at radial velocity today, so that's not so necessary. Anyway, we now have, so now we have information about the Pleiades cluster. What we're gonna do now is construct a query that looks towards the Pleiades cluster center and uh, gives us the stars that are within the field of view. And <clears throat> the first part of this query, the select part of the query, is is the information that's going to come back. So these are the columns. If you think of the if you think of the database as just a big rectangular table, it's got rows and columns. Each row corresponds to a star. Each column corresponds to a different uh, property of the star. Um, so in this case, we're going to get a bunch of astrometric measurements, which, uh, as I said earlier, are the position and motion of the star. So we're going to get its right its um, right ascension, we're going to get its declination, its parallax, uh, proper motion and right ascension, proper motion and declination, and its radial velocity. <clears throat> we're also going to get some photometric measures. Uh, we're going to get its G magnitude, that's its overall brightness. We're going to get its BP magnitude, which is the blue photometer. That's its brightness in the blue part of the spectrum. And we're going to get its red, RP, red photometer, uh, value. That's its brightness in the red part of the spectrum. Uh, we're also going to get, but not use, um, extinction and reddening parameters. Um, and we're also going to get the, the distance, the, di the distance of the object away from us. And so uh, that's what we're going to get back. Um, <clears throat> the uh, where clause of this query contains a, a phrase called contains. And so this is the part that actually implements the cone search. Um, the parameters to the cone search here, 57 or 56.75, uh, that's the right ascension from the Simbad catalog, uh, 24.1, that's the declination from the Simbad catalog. And then the radius of the cone search is this parameter 3.0, so that's 3.0 degrees. So we're going to look 3.0 degrees around uh, that right ascension and that declination. And then um, we're going to fetch the information from the Gaia source table. That's the, that's the main Gaia table. That's the table that's got the 1.7 billion records for each one for each star. And then uh, we're going to put a bunch of um, uh, observation quality filters on it, which um, uh, basically filter out spurious or measurements that aren't really quite up to spec. Okay. And uh, these quality filters came out of the paper. Uh, that I referenced earlier, the one that we got the cluster membership list from. So let's not worry about that. So basically we take that whole query and we paste it into our uh, telescope eyepiece and we hit submit query. And uh, when we come back, we have a, a data file with 24,867 stars. $64 question is which of those stars are actually, actually belong to the Pleiades, okay? All right. <clears throat> So let's take a look at what we got. <clears throat> let's take a look at what we got back from that cone search. If we plot the individual stars in right ascension and declination, we get this nice green dot. Um, and a, f a few interesting things about the green dot. Uh, first of all, it's got some blank spaces. Um, so these are, for reasons I don't know, but for whatever reason, these are regions, these are areas of the sky that uh, Gaia didn't survey or if it did survey, it didn't get uh, high enough quality answers uh, for them to be included. So you see just a couple of, couple of blank spots, but for the most part, the, the, um, <clears throat> for the, most part, the, uh, um, uh, the field is filled. 
and there's you know 20 just short of 25,000 stars in this in this graph. Another thing to notice about this graph is that it's uh, mostly green. Um, and if you look on the little scale over here, it looks like they're going to be green corresponds to uh, a little bit less than a thousand parsecs away. And if you look really close, uh, you can see some blue dots scattered in there. And the blue dots are going to going to correspond to, to uh, distance measurements that are less than um, less than 100 parsecs away. So speaking of distance, let's take a look at a histogram of the distance of these individual star members. And uh, you can see that you know the distance makes a nice uh, bell curve, not exactly symmetric, um, but the you know the median distance I'd say is about 750 parsecs away. Um, and that would that would you know that would agree with the plot to the to the left. Um, and if you look closely, you'll see a dotted red line and a, a a blue spike. So we have a whole bunch of stars almost over top of this red dotted line. And um, <clears throat> as it turns out, not coincidentally, um, that if you take the parallax data from the Simbad entrance entry that we looked at on the previous slide and convert that into parsecs, uh, you come out with 135.8 parsecs, which if I plot on this graph, which I plotted on this graph is the dotted red line, that's almost exactly over top of the spike in the histogram. So it would be a good guess that, um, that, the, that this spike corresponds to the members of the, of the Pleiades, okay? <clears throat> Now we can also um, we can also look at our search results. We can use the same distance color coding um, as the, as in the previous plots. Uh, we can also look we can also plot their motion in right ascension and their their motion in declination. We can we can plot them on a grid of of their motion. And so um, on the left, the graph the the panel on the left. Uh, it's just all sources. It's just all 25,000 stars. And there's a couple of outliers that mess up the graph. Um, these guys, you know, these guys here at 600 uh, milli arc seconds, minus 600 milli arc seconds per second. And this guy over here at 400 and 500 or so milli arc seconds. So that kind of screws up the view. Um, and those stars are probably, those stars would probably warrant their own investigation, but uh, not a topic for now. Um, so if we zoom in, if we zoom in on, uh, if we constrain the proper motion to be, be between 100, minus 150 and 150 milli arc seconds per year, uh, you can see a little bit more detail. And notice uh, most of the stars in the, in the center cluster here are uh, in that green uh, distance category. So, you know, 750 to 1,000 parsecs away. But we have this little blue beehive down here. And um, if you look over on, on a uh, panel on the right, where we look between minus 50 and 50, uh, proper motion between minus 50 and 50, uh, we also plot the, uh, the known proper motion of the Pleiades. Notice that the crosshairs hit right on that, on, that, on that blue blob, okay? So there's more evidence that that blue blob is in fact the members of the Pleiades. Hi, Kevin. Um, I got one uh, inquiry whether the, uh, you also plot uh, magnitudes? Uh, not possible? here. Uh, it is possible, but I'm not plotting them here. Uh, the magnitudes were actually... Here. <laughs> Here's the magnitudes. The magnitudes oh, okay. are the y-axis here, right? So... Uh, and these are absolute magnitudes. These are magnitudes that have been um, been adjusted for uh, the distance that the that the object is away from us. And bonus, if you attend my uh, Python talk here in a few <laughs> minutes, uh, you will actually plot these yourself. So stay tuned. Great. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. <clears throat> Okay, so uh, from the paper, from the learned paper, we have a list of known members, and then we have this big pile of 25,000 stars in the search results. So let's see how the two compare. Uh, essentially, we have three cases to consider. Uh, they're the stars that were turned by the cone search and not in the known member list. So those would be, you would generally think of those as just being background stars. 
there's stars that are returned by the cone search and in the known member list. So hallelujah, these are the stars that our cone search actually found. These are the Pleiades members that we actually found. And then there's um, stars in the known member list that weren't returned by the cone search. And so the question is, why did our cone search not find these? All right, so if we take a look at the graph, the uh, gray background is the first case. Um, these are the these are the stars that aren't in the known known member list. The blue dots are the ones that we in fact found that our code search found, so that's good. Um, and the red dots are the ones that we didn't find. So the red dots, we're not not too concerned at all about the red dots that are outside the search radius um, because you know we didn't find them. Primarily, we didn't find them because um, our search radius wasn't big enough. And if I made the search radius big enough to include all those guys, I'd have a ton more than 25,000 stars to deal with. So just to keep this project, keep this problem sort of manageable, I, I kept the cone search down to about three degrees. Um, concerning though, is the red dots that are within the um, field of view within the gray circle. And so those are members of the Pleiades that for whatever reason we didn't find when we searched. And my suspicion is, although I haven't actually verified this quantitatively, my suspicion is that those, st those are stars that didn't meet the filter criteria, the observation quality criteria that we, uh, that we imposed on the uh, cone search. I don't know that for a fact, but that's my suspicion. So if I relax those, I'd probably get fewer red dots and more blue dots, but uh, anyway, that's a theory at the moment, speculation. Uh, okay. So now uh, here's, a, here's, the, uh, <clears throat> here's a comparison to the HR diagram. And on the left side is the uh, plot of the HR diagram, the same plot, only different colors maybe, uh, same plot from the previous slide of the HR diagram. This is the known member list. These are the guys that the uh, authors of the, of the Gaia paper say are the Pleiades members. And the graph on the right is the cone search results. Um, the plotted in the HR diagram. And so, um, let me see if I can do this. Annotate, let's do where's spotlight, spotlight. Oops, that's not gonna work right. Hold on a minute. There we go. <clears throat> um, yeah, so notice notice a couple of things when you compare these two. First of all, down here in the white dwarf area, there's there's you know many 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 more members. Um, this whole feature here uh, is just flat out not represented on the on the Pleiades side. Uh, you got a lot more stuff. You got a lot a lot more um, uh, bluer, hotter stars uh, than you do in the Pleiades, and then you have a whole lot of stuff here uh, going on in the in the red red giant area. So clearly, um, clearly from this diagram, we're dealing with two different populations, right? Um, so the, you, you've got the, the Pleiades stars over here, and this is a very nice, well-defined, well well-behaved um, uh, HR diagram, and the, the stars that came back from our cone search are um, sort of all over the place. All right, how do I stop this? Uh -oh. There we go. All right. So now let's take a look at mixture models. What exactly is a mixture model? Um, so we're going to take a quick tour into machine learning here. <clears throat> and first of all, uh, machine learning comes in two flavors. There's supervised machine learning and unsupervised. What we're doing here is unsupervised. Uh, supervised learning is the case where you have uh, <clears throat> you have a population and you know um, there, there's some variable, there's something that describes that population that you know ahead of time, and you're trying to fit a model that allows you to uh, explain that known variable. Unsupervised learning, on the other hand, is, or by contrast, unsupervised learning is you have a population and you're trying to identify trends and patterns within that population without knowing a priori uh, what those trends and patterns are. So unsupervised learning sometimes is called data mining. Um, and essentially what we have here is um, uh, we have a population, we got this, these search results, 25,000 stars, and we're going to try and find patterns within them. All right. <clears throat> so um, 
in order to explain mixture models, I'm going to explain what they're not first. Um, so just imagine you had a bunch of data points and you plotted them on a, a Cartesian coordinates. And you can, you can see, you can eyeball this and you can just see that, um, uh, you can see that they fall into two groups, right? It's just pretty obvious. Um, and so uh, you can run this k-means clustering algorithm and it'll basically sort them into two groups. What it does iteratively is it uh, starts off with some idea what the group means would be and then figures out which ones are the closest to that mean, which, which data points are the closest to that mean, and then it assigns the uh, data points to the, to the cluster. And it recomputes the means within the cluster, runs through the algorithm again, uh, keeps cycling around, keeps iterating around until the, the until the values of the means doesn't change, um, or doesn't you know changes by less than some tolerance amount. Um, the algorithm has the advantage of being very simple and very fast to implement. Um, so if you have a huge data set, it, it runs pretty fast. Um, it has disadvantage. Oops. It has disadvantages in that. <clears throat> the clusters that it finds, uh, you'll notice from this diagram, the clusters are disjoint. There's no overlap. There's no provision for saying that this particular, um, this particular element might be in this cluster or it might be in this cluster. We're just really not sure. There's no ambiguity there. Um, the other disadvantage of this is that these clusters are round. Uh, they're, they're perfectly circular. And in 3D space, the clusters would be spherical. Um, the problem with that is that that doesn't allow for any interaction or any uh, correlation between the, the variables that you apply, uh, the variables that you, that you use to develop your clusters on. And the fact that the, the, the assumption that the variables in, are independent is almost never met in practice. So you need something that's a little bit more flexible. Enter Gaussian mixture models. And this diagram, <clears throat> this diagram is, is, shows a one dimensional data set. And uh, you can see that, you know, there's probabilities associated with the membership of each dot in each cluster. And so uh, if you look over here, this green dot, you know, there's some, there, there's a decent chance that the green dot is actually part of the green cluster. There's also a decent chance that the green dot is part of the orange cluster. Um, and likewise over here, this particular blue dot you know, it's who's to say whether it's part of the green cluster or it's part of the, um, uh, whether it's part of the blue cluster. So the advantage of a mixture model is that you can, <clears throat> you can be a lot more nuanced in terms of which group uh, your data belongs in. Um, this graph doesn't show it, um, but the, so if we were to model something in, in more than one dimension, like two, uh, the cluster, the shape of the clusters can be elliptical, and so um, so you can you can you can have a much more robust uh, characterization of your data set um, if you relax the assumption that the resulting clusters are spherical. And again, uh, if you really want the lowdown on this, you can take a look at the Wikipedia article, which is pretty good, um, and it'll it'll explain what these uh, Gaussian clusters look like. All right, um, so. Uh, we need to we need to develop a feature matrix to feed into the cluster. And how am I doing for time? You got lots of time. Keep going. Okay. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so we need a feature matrix to feed into the in, into the into the mixture model. And what I've shown on the board here is just the first ten or fifteen rows of of the data that we have. Um, <clears throat> so the columns that are uh, right ascension, declination, distance. Uh, PMRA, PMDEC, that's proper motion, right ascension, declination. <clears throat> that's, the, that's the data that we get from the Gaia database, okay? Um, and so uh, that, that's, you know, that's kind of the raw data. We refine that a little bit by taking the right ascension, declination, distance and converting it into Cartesian, 3D Cartesian coordinates. And so uh, AstroPy, again, if you show up in my, uh, my later talk, you'll see how to do this. Um, <clears throat> AstroPy allows you to convert right ascension declination distance directly into uh, X, Y, and Z coordinates. Um, that's the position of the object in 3D space. So after we make that transformation, um, essentially we have a five-dimensional matrix 
uh, or, or you know we characterize each star uh, in five dimensions. It's X, Y, and Z position. It's positional information in, in three of those dimensions, and it's motion uh, left and right and up and down as the other two dimensions. So that's what goes in. Um, as I said at the beginning, we have uh, hyperparameters. Hyperparameters are things that determine the structure or the architecture of the model that you're using. And so in the case of <clears throat> in the case of a Gaussian mixture model or this particular kind of Gaussian mixture model, uh, one of the hyperparameters you have to specify is the number of components. So of that 25,000 stars, how many groups do we want to find within it? So we have to specify a priori, which is kind of a pain. You have to specify up front <clears throat> how many clusters we want to find. We want to find, you know, two clusters. We want to find 10 clusters. We want to find 30. Um, and, the, you know, it's essentially the number of subpopulations that we're trying to identify. Um, and you got to specify it. Uh, general rule of thumb is that the fewer the better, right? You don't want to, in the extreme case, you don't want to have uh, as many clusters as you have stars, right? Because every star would belong to one cluster and you wouldn't be able to see any trends. Uh, you don't want one cluster either because all this, because that wouldn't tell you anything. So uh, truth and beauty is somewhere in between. Um, and, uh, you know, just generally speaking, the fewer clusters that you're dealing with, the better. All right. <clears throat> second parameter, second hyperparameter that you got to pick for this kind of model is what's called the covariance type. And what the covariance parameter to the, what the covariance hyperparameter specifies is the shape of, or it, it specifies constraints on the shape of the clusters that come out. And so, um, uh, Basically, you have four choices here, spherical, tied, diagonal, and full. And um, since we just, uh, since we were just bashing k-means cluster for doing spherical, uh, we don't especially want to use spherical. Um, tied and diagonal and full um, are just different shapes of the ellipses. Um, if, uh, for example, if you were, um, uh, if you're working in two dimensions, uh, tied diagonal and, and full specify the shape of the ellipses that the clusters uh, that the clusters would cover. Okay, so anyway, so we have these hyperparameters, and so which you know what's an analyst to do? Uh, a good analyst will search over the hyperparameter space to identify the optimal model. Okay, and that's what we do next. And uh, in this case. Uh, we are lucky enough to have what's called the Bayesian information criteria. Test on this tomorrow, by the way, so take good notes. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> the BIC, as it affectionately known, uh, has the formula that's up there, again, out of Wikipedia, where else? Um, and the key thing of the BIC is less is more. Essentially what the BIC is measuring is it's, uh, the, the, the BIC has this term this K times the LN of N. So N is the number of observation, in our case, the number of stars. K is a measure of the complexity of the model. And in our case, that's um, a function of the um, covariance type. So we, we have a covariance type and we have um, um, the number of clusters. And so this, is a, this really acts as a penalty measure. And um, um, as your model score goes up, it's penalized by the increase in complexity, right? So you can make a model, you can make a model fit perfectly, but if the model is so complex that it doesn't generalize, well, it's not a very good model. And this penalty, this penalty term in the, in the BIC is what, what allows you to, to, to distinguish that. So anyway, so we have, uh, if we search over our hyperparameter space, we get this graph. Um, <clears throat> and as it turns out, the, um, the, the optimum model, i.e. the model with the best BIC, um, has eight components and a covariance type of full. Armed with that information, um, we recreate the model with the optimal parameters, these ones, and then we compute each component's uh, member, compute each uh, membership probability for each star, and then assign the stars to the components to which they have the highest probability of belonging. Right, so we searched over the parameter space, we found the best model, we applied that model to the stars, and then we did the cluster assignment. Okay, all right, so what did we get? Um, <clears throat> 
So these are the um, these are the stars in the remember that these are the stars in the cone search, and um, <clears throat> on the left is our distance histogram, and on the right is our proper motion diagram. And you can see we have a we have a set of we have a cluster we have a, an, an identified group of stars at around um, 150 parsecs, which hallelujah that's our that's our that's where our Pleiades lives. And then these other clusters are different groups that the that the uh, machine learning algorithm found, um, and they're you know they're scattered out at different distances. And you'll notice that there's a fair amount of overlap. Uh, in the um, in the distances, that's a good thing. That's a feature of the Gaussian mixture model. And if you look on the right, here's our uh, distance and our um, proper motion. Uh, these are, uh, by the way, these are these are color coded by the group that the stars belong to. But notice down here, <clears throat> we have um, we have these uh, sort of light blue colored stars, and that corresponds to the um, well. Okay, <laughs> which gave it away. Which group is the Pleiades? Uh, you have this. You know, you have this group here, um, uh, which looks like it was the uh, the group that corresponded to the Pleiades from our previous plot. Okay, so to answer the question, which group really belongs to the Pleiades? What we can do is we can go back to Simbad. We can go back to Simbad, and we we get our um, treasure up our Simbad entry for the Pleiades, and the information in that catalog entry has enough information to produce the feature matrix for the for the cluster center. So we take that feature matrix, we slam it through our uh, optimized uh, mixture model, and then we can figure out which uh, component to assign the cluster center. To which component should we assign the cluster center? And if we do that, we get the following results. And uh, lo and behold, cluster number two, the, the cluster Pleiades center has the highest probability of belonging to group number two, 97 and a half percent, two and a half percent chance of belonging to number six, and uh, virtually zero, uh, vir virtually zero chance of belonging to any of the other ones. So cluster number two is the guy. All right, go back to our diagram, <clears throat> and as it turns out, cluster, no cluster number two is the, is the light blue ones, uh, the, the one on the leftmost side of the screen at, at roughly 150 parsecs away, and the, um, um, the light blue uh, clump of, of stars there at proper motion, uh, minus 45 and, and 20, okay? All right. So now if we go back to the, uh, if we go back to the full field of view and look at the, the stars that we just, the stars that we just declared to be members of the Pleiades, this is how they, this is how they um, pan out in that field of view. And notice that our extreme cases, this is kind of weird, notice that our extreme cases here uh, showed up as being members of the Pleiades and not being background stars. So that's, uh, that's, that's quasi bogus right there. Um, and if we go in a little bit further, we can see that the members are clustered around the, the magic point. And um, if we go in even further, you can see that the, um, the, the that this cluster is is almost exclusively identified as being Pleiades members. Okay. All right. So let's take a look at how. Okay. So now we have those intuitive fields for how the model did. Let's take a look at uh, how it how it actually. Let's let's get a little more quantitative here. All right. So the accuracy of the model. So this is this measure is for any given star, did we get the right answer? And so we look through our, our list of 25,000 stars and for 95% of them, almost 96% of them, we get the right answer. So yippee, um, you know, sounds good. Well, not so fast. Uh, as it turns out, the other measures of model performance, one is recall, the other is precision. Recall is the probability that we found a Pleiades member. The model actually correctly predicted a Pleiades member. And so our recall is 100%. Again, hallelujah. So we found all the Pleiades members, at least the ones that were in the field of view. We found all the Pleiades members. Well, that's great. However, uh, our precision, 43, 43% you can think of, our precision is less than half. So for all the, all the stars that this model is calling Pleiades members, only 43% of them are actually Pleiades members. So that's a bit of a drag. That's not very good. <clears throat> so here's, um, in uh, data science, this is called a confusion matrix, a term I really love. Um, but you can see for 
um, you know, the ground truth where we know member versus non-member. This is, this is from, the, um, um, from the Gaia paper uh, membership list where we know something is a member or a non-member. You can see <clears throat> we didn't call any members non-members, right? Zero. Um, and we didn't, uh, and so for the non-members, we called, uh, you know, 20, 23,000 of them non-members. Um, the 846, these are the true members, right? So, so 800, so this is our 100%. So of the 846 members that were in the field of view, we found, we called 846 of those guys members. So the model's good in that regard. But this 1116, um, uh, false positives. This is troubling. So the so the model is actually not that good. All right. Can I can I, uh, I got a couple questions that might be a good good break point here for you if you got a minute here. Sure. Um, uh, from John McCullough, did Guy or uh, you not include the z velocity in the proper motion? Guy had a radio velocity instrument on board. Uh, Assume to get that information. So radio velocity is a bit of a sore point. <clears throat> because uh, actually very few of the Gaia records have radial velocity in them. And so where radial velocity was available, well, if I, <clears throat> if I used the stars that had, uh, you know, basically the complete uh, set of observations, um, the, the, the population would go way down. It would go down to about 10% of what it is. So, um, I don't want to scroll back to it, but the, the, the first slide I showed that had the different bubbles for the different measurements, there's only about 1% of the Gaia population that, that has a radial velocity measurement. And so, um, so I purposely excluded that because doing so gave me a lot more data to work with. Okay. Um, from Preston, what level degree are you pursuing? Uh, I'm not pursuing any degree. What, you mean a degree uh, of accuracy? No, I'm sorry. I think he meant your uh, astronomy, if you're going to go for a PhD in astronomy or something. No, I'm, I'm a second-year student. <laughs> second uh, year John, student. Okay. Uh, John McCullough, uh, maybe I missed it. Did you arbitrarily chose eight groups, or did the algorithm come up with that? Did you try a different number of groups? Yeah, let's go back to that. And uh, Wolfgang is uh, leaving now, so thank you very much, Wolfgang, uh, uh, for everything, uh, and uh, we'll talk to you later. Talk to you later. Bye. Thanks, Wolfgang. <clears throat> um, yeah, so did I arbitrarily choose eight? Well, I chose, uh, I chose you know, one through eight, um, and I cut it off at eight because I didn't want, you know, just kind of arbitrarily, I didn't want to get any more complicated than that. Uh, so, yes, yeah, so that was arbitrary. Um, given that we have all those false positives, um, I might be inclined to crank that number up to, you know, 28 or 38 or something and see what goes on. If you look at the BIC, whoops, go back to the BIC, you'll see that this thing kind of monotonically decreases, um, which would suggest that I should maybe keep going. Um, but for purposes here and just to cut this off, uh, I, just, I, I just went one through eight. Okay, um, and uh, this is almost that same slide uh, from John Colt. Q for Kevin, uh, well, did you try using PCA or PLS instead of K-means to identify correlated groups in the cone search results, uh, which could then be inspected to help with uh, model feature selection? No. <laughs> no. Uh, no. Um, uh, I was actually looking for an application to use uh, mixture models. Uh, I, I've used mixture models uh, in completely unrelated applications like classifying newspaper articles. Um, and I've had uh, uh, pretty decent success with that. Uh, I am somewhat familiar, but not very, with uh, principal component analysis. I'm not sure what the other choice there was. Um, PLS, and, yeah. PLS, no, I'm not really familiar with that. Um, so no, I didn't use it. Um, Kind of interesting here is, uh, or kind of an interesting little ironic piece tidbit, is that um, in order to run the mixture model, in order to, to fit the mixture model, you have to start off with uh, initial estimates of what the cluster centers are. And the way the algorithm works is it actually runs k-means. So <laughs> the first pass cluster centers are all done by k-means, and then the, then, the, um, then the actual mixture model takes over from there. So this, in fact, did use k-means. 
um, under the hood, but uh, the, it, it doesn't surface the results. And he says PLS is a sort of supervised PCA. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. Well, All right. Um, if it's supervised, I was, I was trying not to use supervised learning here because basically what I, where I want to go with this is I want to be able to point the telescope anywhere in the sky and get a, get a pile of results and then find clusters within those results and then, of course, find the, the, the McManus cluster and, uh, you know, take my ticket to fame and fortune. So, yeah. uh, so this is a this is the start of hopefully a more general purpose uh, capability where you could just look at a, any arbitrary field of view and see if there's a cluster in there and see if that cluster corresponds to anything that's already known. But, okay, and and, and last but not least, I'm sorry, last but not least, Kevin, uh, you got uh, for both presentations, uh, you've got till 1845 or. Uh, 45 after, so if you um, so if you want to time that a little uh, for both presentations. Okay. All right, let's uh, let's wrap this one up. We're almost done. Um, yeah. Okay. So here's a picture of here's a picture of what's wrong with the model. So the blue dots are the members from the known known member list, um, and you can see that they they plot right over top of our cluster group number two, which is the which are the red dots. But you'll see in addition that the red dots are scattered all over the place in uh, proper motion, uh, right ascension, and and declination. So that's the problem. That's the problem that's got to be fixed with this model. All right. <clears throat> so conclusions. Um, you know, good news is we identified all the cluster men, uh, cluster members. The model may or may not be useful as a first pass screen. Um, but its main drawback is it's got way too many false positives, right? It's going to it's going to conclude way too many patients are sick, and uh, you know you're going to spend all your time chasing down people who aren't really sick. So um, so that's got to get fixed. Um, how do we fix it? Um, <clears throat> this model is crying out for additional features. Um, I'm not exactly sure what those additional features are going to be. Um, uh, my astronomy teacher suggested maybe using apparent magnitude or star color. Uh, I'm not so sure I agree with that. I need to internalize whether that's a good idea or not, but certainly wouldn't hurt to try it. Um, <clears throat> uh, another thing occurred to me, too, uh, thinking about this, another way that this might, might um, uh, improve is that for each star, I get a vector of eight probabilities, um, and it's the, the probability that um, that the star belongs to the ith cluster. And so, what I did, the way I did the cluster assignments, is I just picked the picked the of the eight, I picked the one that had the highest probability. And so, what I think I can do instead is just set a threshold. And so, like only the stars that have a probability greater than sixty percent of being of belonging to member two uh, actually belong to member two. So I think if I made the assignment that way, um, I have a decent chance of getting rid of um, some per spurious assignments. So anyway, that's uh, a lot of a lot of future experimentation. And of course, there's always the different model architecture. Um, we can try different models, PCA, PCLS, uh, different hyperparameters, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so the data is easy to get, and um, you know, a lot, lot of stuff you can do. All right, questions. I got from uh, John McCullough, uh, what about age of the stars for another feature? Or would that restrict the number of stars to the lack of age data? Um, yeah, the age is, uh, <clears throat> the Gaia data goes through these things called data releases. So first there was data release one, then there's what we're working with now is data release two. And uh, coming soon, um, before the COVID panic hit, uh, is data data release three. So data release three promises to have much more, much richer data on um, radial velocity. So some of the things that we can't do now with, uh, because we don't have radial velocity measurements, uh, hopefully that constraint will ease. Um, and then another thing that um, that they'll provide is uh, metallicity, metallicity measurements, which are directly related to the age of the star um, or the, the population that the star was a member of when the star was formed, I guess to be a little bit more precise. Um, uh, so, so between the uh, uh, metallicity measurements and the radial velocity measurements, I think we'll be able to do some, uh, a lot more interesting stuff. So, okay, um, from John Colt, really nice work. Thanks for taking the time to show it to us. Okay, well, thank you. Thanks everybody. And uh, so, uh, okay, you can go ahead and uh, uh, now he's gonna jump into a demo of all this. Yep. Yeah, and um, sort of. All right, let's see. 
So you unshare this, that one and then you reshare the other one, I guess. Yeah, there you go. All right. <clears throat> okay. So you guys have been sitting there all this time listening to me rattle on. Uh, <clears throat> this time we are, this is audience participation. So we're going to use the Google Collaboratory. We're going to run a Python notebook, and we're going to look at a, look at a bunch of data uh, very similar to what we just looked at. So the first thing to do, uh, if you look on the left side of the screen, you'll see what to enter where. And I'm going to enter it here on the right side of the screen so you can kind of see what happens as we, as we go through this. So the first thing to do is open up a, open up a browser, in my case, uh, uh, Chrome. Any browser will do. And you type in Google collab.research.google.com. Um, type that into the um, into the search bar, and then that'll bring up Google Collab. And then uh, over here is select GitHub. So I'll wait for a minute. Uh, how folks are coming on that? Good so far. All right, so we hit the GitHub button. And then in the first thing, you type in the name of the repo that you're getting from, which is Kevin McManus. And you hit the search thing. Now, since I hit this about a thousand times a day, um, it comes up with the right repo for me. So you wanna make sure that in this, in this pull down here, it says Kevin McManus slash cast tau, C-A-S-T-A-U. And that's what this is over here. So Ed Harfman says uh, everyone needs to log in on that. So uh, uh, if you don't log in now, you'll have to log in later. Okay. Well, hmm. yeah, he's he's probably right. He's probably right. Um, yeah, I was just thinking I tested this on my wife's account, but she's already logged in. So, yeah, I think Ed's probably right there. All righty. So once you uh, – <clears throat> Once you hit GitHub, <clears throat> search for Kevin McManus slash cast tau, um, make sure, you, or, you know, bring up the repo, Kevin McManus, uh, hit the search, hit the magnifying glass, and then hit the pull down to get cast tau. And then the first guy on the list should be this thing called AstroPy tutorial. All right, so I'm gonna click that now, which is gonna make all this stuff go away. Takes a minute to load. Now I'm going to switch to full screen, which is going to obscure the obstructions. All right, so hopefully folks are with me. Yep. All right. <clears throat> okay, so uh, late last night I rearranged the order of this plot. Once I realized that I was the last speaker standing, be standing between the participants and the bar. So uh, I decided to put all the fun stuff up first. It's and a virtual bar, so you're not too, uh, don't worry <laughs> yeah, too much, right? right? <laughs> everybody's, everybody's already at the bar. Um, <clears throat> so I put all the fun stuff up first, um, which, uh, so this is, a, this is a demonstration of AstroPy. And AstroPy is a Python library, and it's got just a tremendous amount of capability, and we're not gonna get anywhere close to demonstrating all of the capability. We'll demonstrate a few basics and we'll demonstrate um, the use of those basics, but we're gonna demonstrate the use of the basics first and then we're gonna go back and then cover the basics. Um, and with uh, hopefully with time, we're gonna actually do a pulsar observation uh, using this data, all right? So <clears throat> first thing you, you do, um, uh, so this is a Jupyter Notebook for those of you that are not familiar with this. Um, this is an interactive Python uh, environment provided by Google. Thank you, Google. And um, yeah, what you're looking at is Python code. And you execute the code by hovering over the, the square bracket in the cells. And you see this little go arrow. And you just hit the go. You hit the go and it's complaining that Google didn't write it. Too bad, Google. <clears throat> you hit the go, and uh, in your case, it's, pro it's since I've been through this demo again a thousand times, um, 
all the all the requisite libraries are already installed but in your case since this is probably your first time in you uh, you'll get messages that it's uh, actually doing an installation of this uh, python library called astro query so astro query is a uh, sister library of astro pi and as it turns out in the google um, google collaboratory python environment the astro pi library is already installed so we have to install astro query but we don't have to install astro pi because it's already there okay and uh, the first few cells here we just we have uh, just a whole bunch of uh, libraries to include in our environment and so if you just click on these things um, we load up all the right environments this third cell here uh, you'll notice that we're getting a whole bunch of AstroPy stuff uh, into our into our environment. So the first thing we're going to do <clears throat> is we're going to go query Gaia. Uh, we're going to go back to our friend Gaia, and we're going to we're going to do a query that's pretty similar to uh, the queries that I used to produce the graphs. Um, we're just going to do a first pass approximation here. We're going to use um, we're just going to query around uh, PMRA of, of uh, 1997, PM deck of minus 45.5, um, right ascension uh, declination. We're just going to hard code those into the query. But what you can see here is you can actually see that this is the ADQL code that goes into the query. And this Gaia launch job is what, is, is what actually goes off and does the query. So this takes, um, at least when I did it this morning, this takes about 10 seconds to run. And uh, it takes even less than 10 seconds to run now. How about that? And when we're done, we get back. This is the, these are the Gaia records um, associated with this particular query. And so we got uh, kind of similar to what we did before. We got the photometric, uh, photometric values, the um, G mean mag, the BP mean mag, and the RP mean mag. And we also got the uh, right ascension and declination. Uh, we also got parallax. Um, from which we're going to calculate distance. All right, so here's some more um, here's some more AstroPy stuff. Um, as you can see here, uh, we calculate <clears throat> this function here calculates distance from the um, parallax value, and uh, the advantage of calculating distance this way is that we get this. Um, again, this is thanks to AstroPy. We get this quantity called distmod. Distmod st is short for distance modulus. And that's the amount of, that's the number of magnitudes that you need to adjust given the distance of an object away from you to adjust it so that what it would look like at a distance, standard distance of 10 parallax, 10, 10, sorry, 10 parsecs. Okay, so, um, so we take the G mean mag, okay, that's the apparent brightness of the object and we adjust it by the dist mod. And from that we get the absolute magnitude. And then the star color, <clears throat> which is uh, which is a proxy for the surface temperature of the star. Um, that's the mean. That's the mean magnitude minus. Or I'm sorry. That's the the brightness in the blue spectrum minus the brightness in the red spectrum. And let's run this cell. This cell takes seconds. And now we're ready to plot. Voila. There's our HR diagram. Okay. All right. So now let's do something a little more complicated. Um, the keynote speaker yesterday, Sutter, is that his name? Um, he yeah, yeah, yeah. So he mentioned the high for, the HI for pi sky survey and a couple of his slides, he actually showed hydrogen, right? He showed galactic hydrogen scattered around the galaxy. So we're gonna do that here because that's fun to do. Um, <clears throat> So if you go to the if you go to the high for pi website, they have this uh, data file, this uh, .dat .gz file, and uh, we're just going to read that we're going to read that sucker right into our um, Python workspace, and um, this takes I don't know 10 15 seconds or so. Um, it's a fairly large data set. <clears throat> 10 15 seconds. 10, 15 seconds. Just let you know, Kevin, you've got about three or four people that are responding uh, that they're they're getting the plots and that's uh, working. All right, far up, good. Yeah, so probably everybody here on the phone call is hitting this <laughs> hitting this data set. So, uh, yeah, so maybe that's why it's <laughs> okay. taking a while. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Well, <clears throat> spoiler alert. 
uh, this is going to deliver on the order of 13 million records into our data frame. And uh, that's, uh, that's, a, that's a pretty big dose of data. <clears throat> a pretty big dose of data no matter how you measure it. So this, uh, this takes a while. I don't know what's going on so slow here. Yeah, I think it's uh, 70 people uh, grabbing that data at the same time. That might be. Yeah, uh... might, might not have been the <laughs> smartest thing to do. Maybe we should have given everybody tickets. <laughs> well, while we're waiting for that, uh, let's go down here. Uh, I can't run any other cells while that's running. Um, let's just look at, uh, let me just give you some background here. Um, so if you're running Python on your local machine, uh, to get the AstroPy library, you need to do a pip install AstroPy, and then that'll install the uh, AstroPy library and all its uh, dependent libraries. Um, I, for one, use the Anaconda environment to manage my Python world. Um, and so in, in the Conda land, you do Conda install AstroPy. Um, that'll give you basically everything you need to know. Um, let's go back and see if we got if our cell finished. Nope, still running. Oops. Okay. So to get the get the thing, just do a pip install, and you'll get it. Um, Py, uh, AstroPy has these things called units. Uh, units are very useful. Um, uh, units allow you to specify dimensional information associated with your scalars, so you don't have just a value like three. You have a value like three meters per second, or um, uh, you have um, uh, you, you have a variety of constants at your disposal, uh, such that you don't have to look them up and type them in. So, for example, there's a built-in constant for Planck's constant, uh, built-in constants for the speed of light. Uh, built-in constant for the gravitational constant. Um, you can look at the constant dot CGS. You can look at it in CGS as opposed to KMS, which is kind of handy. And let's see if we finished. Oh, come on. Oh, come on. Well, I'll tell you what. I am going to interrupt this. Let's see if I can get this. There we are. Okay, so I, I killed that query. Uh, that's too bad. Uh, let's go through. All right, let's uh, let's let's quickly look at these constants. All right, so we'll import the constants module. Here's a gravitational constant, and, and as you can see, it's got uh, units associated with it. Um, if you print it out here, you get a little bit more information about it. Um, Planck's constant, speed of light, um, speed of light, and CGS. Um, so it's uh, useful that you don't have to remember how to convert all that stuff. Uh, let's take a look at units. Units is what allows you to supply uh, dimensions. Uh, one unit is a watt. You get a watt. There's a watt. Uh, here's 632.3 watts, 632.3. Um, if you look at the types, um, so the type of 632.3 is a float. Uh, type of a u dot watt is a unit watt. And 633 632.3 times u dot watt is what's called an astropy quantity. Okay, and there it is. So this this is how we make one, and um, that's what you get. Uh, so here's a fun little exercise we can do. Here's the uh, hydrogen alpha line at 656.28 uh, nanometers. Um, I can never remember whether anometer, angstrom are, are greater than or less than nanometers. Is it, you know, do you divide by 10 or you multiply it by 10? You don't have to. You can just use the, um, the dot two method and convert it to angstrom. And so 656.28 nanometers converts to 6,562.8 angstrom. Right, we can we can calculate frequency, fr calculate the frequency associated with the hydrogen line, and uh, you just do the division. Um, comes out kind of strange, right? You get this four, five, six, eight hundred five point seven two meters per nanometer per second. It's probably not the answer you're looking for, but we can easily convert that to gigahertz. Ta -da. There it is. Um, one thing that is useful, one thing I, I find myself working a lot with are these angle quantities. And here's what's uh, useful about them. So I have a little routine here, which uh, just takes an angle as an argument, and it just prints out the uh, angle in degrees. 
Um, and so I can call the, I can call this function with um, 60 times u dot degrees. Okay, so there's the angle specified in degrees, and lo and behold, I get degrees. I can also specify it in milli arc seconds. MAS stars, stands for milli arc seconds. So when you're working with Gaia data, you got a lot of milli arc seconds floating around. Um, so if I take 3600 times 1000 times u dot MAS, I should get one degree. So one degree and change. Um, let's see. So here's um, uh, coordinate systems. Uh, AstroPy has a lot of coordinate systems. Um, two sets of coordinates, two generic sets is the sky coordinates. So these are positions in the sky and then it's got earth locations. Uh, we're not gonna look at earth locations today, um, but we can get sky coordinates of the Pleiades and we can just, uh, this actually will call Simbad behind the scenes. And uh, there it is. And um, there are the coordinates. And if we want to get the right ascension, uh, this is kind of bogus, I think. <clears throat> um, if you just print out the right ascension, it prints it out in degrees, minutes, and seconds. It's probably not what you want. So you can convert it to u dot hour, and then you get um, three hours, 47 minutes, zip seconds. And then uh, you can convert those coordinates very easily to galactic. You just type in Pleiades.galactic and you get the, um, uh, the L and B. L is uh, galactic longitude and B is galactic latitude. You get those, those, um, uh, you get those coordinates. Uh, let's see. All right, I'm going to sh I'm going to skip the hydrogen plot, which is unfortunate. Uh, you guys should you, should, you guys should get the notebook and and run that query and let that query complete, and then go through um, go through the go through the cells that are uh, underneath it, and you'll get some nice pretty pictures. These these cells uh, go through all these cells, and you'll get some nice pretty pictures. Um, and you'll get a nice hydrogen map of the universe. Uh, I'm sorry, of the galaxy. Um, and then if you run uh, if you run this Simbad catalog query, um, well, it's, this I can run. Okay, so <clears throat> here we're going to do a catalog query and we're going to drag up information for the nine nearby clusters that we looked at in the paper. We're going to qu query this out of Simbad. Um, you get a couple warnings which you can ignore. This is the table that we get back. Um, Where's Pleiades? Here's Pleiades again, three hours, three hours, 47 minutes, right ascension, 24 um, declination. And there's the parameters that we looked at in the paper. Um, the, all these AstroPy things also work really well on vectors. So you don't have to write a lot of code to, to get from one to another. So we're gonna take this whole table and turn it into an array of vector, uh, I'm sorry, a vector of coordinates. That's what this cell does. And uh, there they are. And, and given that vector of coordinates, if we wanted to convert them to galactic coordinates, we can just do that. Okay, so pretty easy. Um, also, like in my data matrix in the previous, um, in the previous uh, talk, uh, I said I had X, Y, Z positions. This is how I got the X, Y, Z positions. So for each star, I had, had its coordinates and then just got the Cartesian, um, got the Cartesian values for it. Yeah, but uh, real quick question. Uh, on your X, Y, Z coordinates, what's uh, zero, zero, zero? Is that the center well, of the galaxy? Zero, 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 zero is going to be the sun. The sun, okay. Um, and there's uh, there's astro pi routines. There's an astro pi routine to um, convert these or to transform them to uh, galactocentric. So if you want to if you want to position everything relative to the center of the galaxy, there's a there's a function to do that. There's okay. functions to do everything, um, and. Uh, if you look through this document, I have URLs, URLs that'll point you at various places and uh, follow those URLs and you'll, you'll find all sorts of things. Um, I can't run this cell because we didn't let the uh, hydrogen, um, hydrogen thing run. Um, uh, but this basically will plot these, this will overplot the clusters, the cluster centers on the hydrogen map. So it's pretty cool when it comes out. All right, so uh, quickly here. Okay, so we're gonna look at a FITS file. You've heard uh, FITS files uh, be tossed around quite a bit. Um, and uh, AstroPy uh, has a lot of capabilities for dealing with FITS files. So we're going to look at a FITS file. And it turns out this is a FITS file that I got from Green Bank. Uh, I did a pulsar observation for everybody's favorite pulsar, um, B0329 plus 54. Um, I did a pulsar observation of that in June of 2019. 
and I got the FITS file, um, which contains um, uh, data at a much higher timing resolution. I think it's 0.004 seconds thereabouts um, um, for that for that observation. So we're gonna we're gonna fetch up that file, and we're gonna take a look at it. And I'm gonna give you the magic decoder ring for um, understanding what the structure what the data structure is within that file. Uh, never in a million years would I have guessed what that is. I had to have help from uh, Dr. Frank Geigo, who's uh, uh, the Green Bank 20-meter 20, 20 telescope person. All right. <clears throat> uh, if you guys hit this, uh, this didn't come out, rats. If you guys hit this cell where it says auth.authenticate under user, you're going to get a cell down here that's got a text entry box. <clears throat> since I've, um, again, since I've run this demo bunch of times, I'm already authenticated, so it, it's not thinking the need, it's not feeling the need to authentic, re-authenticate me. But basically what you'll do is in that box, there will be a, a link that you need to click on and it takes you to an authentication page from which you select your account and then it gives you a magic key and you paste that key into the box. So I'm sorry I can't show that. I was hoping I'd be able to show it because it's a little bit tricky. Um, but uh, anyway, good luck with that. Hope you make out. Um, and furthermore, uh, one thing that's useful, um, it's pretty obscure how to actually get uh, files mounted onto your Google Collab system. And these three cells, these three cells will show you how to do it. So, uh, so you want to keep this notebook uh, for that information. So uh, anyway, so we authenticated. Uh, we need to install some additional software, this thing called GC GCS Fuse, which um, allows you to mount your Google Cloud storage. Um, before this demo, I, I took the, um, uh, the, the FITS file that I got from GreenBank and, and I uploaded it to Google Cloud Storage and I made it publicly available. So you guys should be able to hit it. Um, and if you can't, let me know and I'll, I'll see what I can do. So now we got to mount that device. Um, so anyway, so, okay, so now we have the, uh, anyway, we got this thing mounted. All right. Um, <clears throat> so we're not looking at any old FITS file. We're looking at what's called a PSR FITS file. It's a, it's a special uh, variant of FITS file called, um, called PSR FITS. And it's, it just has extensions to uh, capture uh, Pulsar observing data. And the general case of a PSS, PSR FITS file is, is on this link here. You can take a look at that. Um, and even, even that won't help you decode what we're, what we're about to deal with. So the first thing we do is open up the file. And uh, notice we do AstroPy from AstroPy IO import FITS. And we open the file <clears throat> and it prints out the, um, it prints out these, these HDU, HDL, HDUL records are um, basically top level metadata that describes what's in the FITS file. So in this case, we have two HDU records, zero and one. One's the primary, one describes what's called the subint table. The subint table is where all the data for this file lives. Um, and so uh, this produces a lot of, <clears throat> these, these, these two portions of the FITS files um, are basically uh, contain a lot of metadata that describes the, um, describes a file. So if we look at the first one, if we look at the header on the first one, you can see we get a bazillion, um, we get a bazillion things and, and there's a lot of information here about the, about the actual observation, like what direction we were looking at, uh, what observation frequency we used, here's the RA and declination that we used, um, et cetera, et cetera. So there's all kinds of metadata in there. Uh, we look at the look at the second header record, the one that contains the um, the um, the subint table. Okay, there's the subint table is this uh, complicated data structure that's got a lot of rows and columns in it, and uh, you can see what's what's described here or what all the rows and columns are. Um, a couple of interesting things here is this value tbin. It's the time sample per bin. So you can see we're dealing, dealing with uh, approximately 4.2 millisecond re timer resolution here. Um, and there's a bunch of, other, bunch of other parameters which we'll look at in a little bit more detail. All right, so the main thing we gotta get is this thing called the subint data table. 
and uh, Dr. Frank Geigo from Green Bank. He's the 20 meter telescope guy. Uh, he and I had a male conversation and he gave me the decoder ring, which I'm about to give to you. And so the, the whole description is here, which you can read. All right, so the first thing, let's take a look at the sampling frequency and the intersampling time. So the <clears throat> sampling frequency is approximately 238.4 samples per second. The intersample time is 0.042, call it, um, uh, seconds, seconds between samples. And uh, let's, let's take a look at um, some of the relevant uh, fields in the header. How do I know these are relevant? Uh, because I stared at this file for a long time and figured out these are the things that I need to look at. Um, so um, things that you need to know are the and number of receivers, number of receivers polarization channels, the observation, cha the number of, number of receiver channels. Um, so we're 1024. Um, yeah. Oh, Scanlon, re requested Scanlon, right, so 180. So this observation uh, transpired over 180 seconds. That's what this is. Now let's look at the metadata that's in uh, the, the data record number two. Um, let's explain these. Uh, I'm gonna, well, there they are. I'll explain them down a little bit lower. Uh, okay, so the data table. So let's get the data table here. <clears throat> this thing called pulsar data is the data portion of the header record, okay? And so if we look at the shape of it, number of rows and number of columns, we see that it's 1,373 something. So this, this thing is a, it, there's, what this says is there's 1,373 sub-int records. And each record, if we want to see what the fields are in each record, run this code, you can see that there's, um, <clears throat> fields one through 17, and there's various things, uh, various various pieces of information that are captured on each of the 1300 subint records. The main thing is this thing called the subint data table. So the subint data table, let me take a look at that. <clears throat> so the subint data table, let's look at the first part of that, the shape of that subint data table. So it's 32 by four by 1024 by two. 1024, you'll remember, is the number of receiver channels that we have. Four, not sure what four is. We'll take a look at that in a moment. Uh, and we're not sure what 32 and two is. So, um, so stay tuned. We'll take a look at that. Uh, the D type, <clears throat> the data type of that is an unsigned 8-bit integer. That's what U int 8 means. All right, so now let's take a look at each of the dimensions in turn. Okay, dimension zero, the leftmost dimension, this guy. Um, <clears throat> it specifies the number of samples on each subint record. So the, the, the subint table is blocked and each block, which is, it, which is corresponds to a record uh, in the subint table, each block contains a number of samples. And in this case, it's 32 samples. So basically what we have is we have 32 samples, 32 data samples per record. And those data samples are, se are separated by 0 0.004 seconds. All right, dimension number one, which is four, um, that's the number of polarization channels. Oops, I guess I'm getting a little European here. Um, <clears throat> it's the number of polarization channels, and the way that's defined is that those channels correspond to the Stokes I, Q, U, and V parameters. We'll see what we do with those momentarily. Um, dimension number two is N-chan, uh, 1024, and remember that's the number of receiver channels that we have. Uh, there's also a couple of parallel arrays in here that are worth noting. Uh, there's this thing called DATFREAK, and DATFREAK gives you the center frequency of each channel. And then there's another thing called DATWEIGHTS, WTS weights, um, and that gives you an indication of whether that channel is subject to uh, RFI or not. So if the value in the in the DATWEIGHTS field is one, it's it's good. It's good. It doesn't have RFI. If the value is zero, you should ignore it, which we will do. And then um, here's the part where the decoder ring is really important. The rightmost channel, dimension three, whose value is two. Um, <clears throat> turns out the way this, this thing comes to you is <laughs> it's 16-bit integers, but they give it to you in two bytes, right? And so it's the least and most significant bytes, respectively, of the 16-bit 16 inter 16 integer value. 
So if you're going to if you're going to if you're going to put it together, you got to uh, add 256 times one of the bytes plus the value of the other byte, and then there's your IQ or V IQ U or V value. So that's that's written up. That's uh, back go up, back up to uh, uh, guy goes thing here. Right, right here it is. Here's the uh, there's the there's the magic decoder ring right there. Okay, all right. So let's put this guy together. How are we doing time? Better hurry up. Yeah, we you got about ten minutes. All right, all right. <clears throat> so anyway, so we're gonna we're gonna take all those we're gonna take all those uh, observations, and we're gonna stack them into into uh, one big long array. And so now the shape of our array. Now we have forty three hundred or forty three thousand, almost forty four thousand uh, individual observations. And remember, these guys are separated by point oh oh four seconds, and we still retain the the uh, four polarization measures, the ten twenty four channels, and the two you know the two bytes. So next we combine the two bytes together, and uh, so we lost the uh, we lost the one dimension, and now we're going to transpose it. Um, I kind of like time as the uh, as the low order dimension, so I, I shove that over to the to the right. And um, <clears throat> yeah, I don't know how familiar you are with Stokes parameters, but the for purposes at hand, the, the the Stoke parameter we're interested in is I, which is intensity. And so we're um, <clears throat> we're just out of this out of this big data array. We're just going to extract the the row that corresponds to intensity. And so that's what uh, which which happens to be row zero. And so uh, so here we go. So now we have now we have a matrix that's uh, 1024 by the number of samples. So that's the number of radio channels by the number of samples for just intensity. Now. Um, I wanted to get the I wanted to get the mask values, so I just I just got the first record, and um, I'm going to make two arrays here. One has got all the data in it. Uh, I'm going to take the mean across the channels, um, and so the Stokes I this variable Stokes I is just the mean across all the channels. Mm -hmm. Stokes I masked. Uh, I should actually be Stokes I unmasked. Um, Stokes I masked is the um, observation across. Uh, the channels that have that don't have RFI data. All right, so I just ran that cell. So this is running again. Make sure I ran it. Okay, so that runs in seconds. And now we're going to compare the masked and the unmasked data. So <clears throat> you can see with a full spectrum, we get uh, with full spectrum versus masked. We get very different, <laughs> very different patterns. Um, with the full spectrum, you know, we get values that are up around 120. What are these? Uh, sorry, I forget what these are. Janskys? Um, possibly, possibly. That would be a good guess because Janskys appears somewhere else in the metadata. So maybe these are Janskys. Um, so anyway, so you know we get values, we get values way high, up around 100, and then it drops off to almost zero. Um, but if we just looked at the mask channels, we see that the that the you know we have this pattern where it where it decreases over time. This is the 180 seconds of the of the observation uh, decreases over time, and the values are you know in the 50s, right? So um, you know between 56 and and. 57 and a quarter, right? That's if we mask them out. So the mean, so so masking out the RFI makes a huge difference um, in the in the um, pattern that we in the pattern that we get. So now, um, so now let's just zoom in a little bit. Um, so let's not worry about this 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 initial decrease. I don't know what's going on there. Um, so let's just zoom in on the period between 100, 125 seconds and 150 seconds in the, into the observation. And so if I do that, I get this. And so if you look at this, just eyeballing it, you can kind of see there's a <clears throat> there's a periodic pattern involved, right? These spikes are the spikes um, both above and below the line. The spikes are happening at, at what appears to be regular intervals. And um, um, so so let's let's just let's just grab the observations for that for that window. That's what this cell does. And uh, you know, so now I have this Stokes I under winds variable. Uh, that's just the that's that's the value value of the observations between 125 and 150 seconds. 
So yesterday, uh, Peter East and uh, some other folks talked about folding. So it turns out folding is really easy to do, uh, in, in, at least in Python code. And so basically what you need to do is you need to figure out, so given a, given a folding parameter, you need to figure out how many rows of your data matrix can you make, and then you just reshape the data matrix to that, um, uh, to that shape. So, um, so I have this little routine here that'll fold. This is the uh, fold matic And um, <clears throat> a little birdie whispered in my ear that the pulse period for this particular pulsar is about 0 .3, 0 0.73 seconds. So I'm gonna fold, I'm gonna fold between um, 0.65 and 0.75 seconds and see if, the, um, see if the folded values resonate. And, and so once I fold, uh, I'm gonna take the maximum value of the folded vector and if the periods, if the if the data values line up, the maximum will be much higher uh, when the when the period is the right. Uh, you know, it's basically finding the resonant frequency is what we're doing. And if we if we if we take the max value, then we can see whether or not the thing folds. So here, I'm going to fold between uh, 0.65 seconds and 0.7 seconds times the sampling frequency because we need to translate this into index into sample numbers. And uh, here we go. Boom, just folded. <laughs> so, and then let's plot the result. And, uh, you know, here's the, here's the folded data. So <clears throat> notice if we fold it around 170, right, that's where we find the highest, uh, highest uh, amplitude, I'd say. And everything else is kind of uh, quite a bit smaller. So if we take that as the peak period. Um, and uh, so that's, you know, we're, we're going to say that that's the, that's the observed uh, period of that pulsar. We're going to fetch out, um, we're going to go fetch the uh, GBO pulsar catalog. I'm not going to print it out, but then we're going to fetch out the value for the, the pulsar under observation and uh, get, get the pub period, the published period. And we're going to print it out. And Look at that, the observed period is 0.713 and the published period is 0.7145. So it's not bad for, not bad for a Sunday morning worth of uh, Python coding. And then if we wanna actually look at the pulse profile, just rec recreate the uh, folded data and uh, here it is. Ta-da, hold your applause. Um, and then I leave a little exercise for the reader. Um, I didn't have time to go through this this morning, but if you want to uh, compute um, fast forward your transforms, um, you can probably get you can probably get a, a more accurate or a better uh, observation on the um, on the on the actual period. And let me just close with. Um, you can read FITS files remotely. This is uh, particularly advantageous when you're dealing with catalog data. So here uh, we're going to read a, a catalog of uh, star membership. Um, and notice that I just gave it a URL, not a, not a local file on there. And uh, table.read, well, <laughs> maybe not the best example here. Uh, this actually would have read a FITS file if I, if I told it to read it as a FITS file, but I told it to read it as an AstroPy table, a little bit more easy to, easy to deal with. But anyway, you know, this is what you get back. So that's the contents of that file, at least the first five records of that file. And uh, that's it. So any questions, anybody? Great. Uh, I got from uh, Skip Crilly. Uh, how can we know that the RFI masking doesn't leave residual RFI in the data? Is there a figure of merit of the masking method based on some calculations? Uh, not that's in the, not that's in the uh, FITS file. Not that I've seen, not, nothing that I've recognized as such as being in the FITS file. Um, I don't know how clean the data is, you know, like how much leakage there is from RFI in one channel into the channel that's sitting beside it. I just, I don't know. I don't have the expertise to answer that. Um, uh, okay. You know, basically, uh, Dr. Geigo, <laughs> Dr. Geigo says, don't look at the channels that have the, have the mask value of zero. So I didn't, uh, took his word for it. Thank you. And I got uh, from Tom Aslan and uh, you know, thanks, Kevin, Ted Klein. So glad both of Kevin's talks are recorded. I am too. Uh, <laughs> this is a, definitely going to take a while to sort through that again. And uh, But uh, excellent talk and excellent uh, good work on all that Python work. That is wonderful stuff.
Yeah, you guys, you guys have the notebook, and so there's, you know, there's, there's really a wealth of information uh, buried in the notebook, and uh, you know, I, I suggest you uh, get a hold of the notebook, save it somewhere, and and refer to it because it it actually took me a while to uh, understand AstroPy and and get it to do anything useful for me. It was pretty frustrating at first, but uh, hopefully I can um, I can uh, uh, spare you that. And, yeah. Uh, from Ethan Waldo, fantastic presentation. Uh, Tom Aslan, yes, we'll need to watch again. First Pi experience. Don, will the recording be published? Yes, it's going to be. Uh, uh, all this is going to be on the site. Uh, hopefully next week, uh, as soon as we get sort of, you know, we've got a lot of recordings going, so we're trying to sort them all out and get them all uh, put up on the site. We're not sure where yet, but uh, we'll tell everybody once it's done. Okay. I'm going to try hitting that. Uh, I'm going to try hitting that hydrogen thing now. Now that everybody else has quit. <laughs> see what happens. Yeah, uh, um, uh, see, Tom Aslan said he got it. Oh, he did. Okay, good. Did, and, and Tom, did you get the uh, did you get the plots too? You can go ahead and unmute Tom if you want. Yes, I um, I also got the plots. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah, there we go. I guess I just got it. Okay, here we go. We can do this real time. Uh, check this out. So, yeah. So it turns out that's a big data array, and if you if you just if you just plotted the data array straight up, it takes 20 minutes. So let's not do that. Um, so we're going to crunch it down to a, a smaller um, smaller granularity or smaller precision. Uh, this takes this takes a couple seconds to do. Good. I got from uh, Skip Curly super presentation. Oh, here we go. All right, so now it's now we can create the plots. Plot takes a couple seconds. While that's running, I'll queue up the next one. There you go. There's your hydrogen plot. Oh, pretty. That's your. Uh, so this is your high for pi. This is the plot that. Uh, well, this is the. This is an equatorial coordinate, and the the one that comes up next is the one that. Um, um, Sutter showed yesterday. Here. So that's his. That's the plot that he showed yesterday. Yep, galactic coordinates, huh? Yeah. yeah so there's, you know, this is all the the AstroPi stuff allows you to to translate from from um, uh, equatorial to to galactic just very seamlessly, and uh, it's you know it's really it's really quite useful. Um, oh, let's. Oh, we can do this plot too. Where'd it go? Uh, this one, this one, this one. I got from Gary Evans, wow, with an exclamation mark. There we go. <laughs> here's the um, here's the hydrogen plot with the uh, with the clusters overlaid. This is cool. Peter East, great presentation, Kevin. Yeah, hey Peter, th same to you, and thanks with the uh, with the. Uh, comments on the folding yesterday because <laughs> I saw your comments on folding and I had this data file that oh I gotta do some folding so I got up this morning and did all that folding stuff and there it is it worked out so that's pretty that's cool. Right. You did yeah, well. yeah. yeah yeah so here, here's the uh here's the hydrogen plot with the um with the clusters over top of it. Pretty cool. Oh nice. All right. All right I'm done. <laughs>